Hak Islam is a path to fulfillment to those that follow it, an enigma to many who don't. It is a state, an ideology, and a people who follow in the footsteps of the Prophet. What is the search for knowledge? What is silk? Who are the assassins? Is this a good depiction of Islam? There are a lot of questions you can and should ask, and in this video, I'll get you started. But there's a lot to explore, especially about Haq Islam, so make sure you subscribe so you can learn more about the Sword of Allah, that is, Haq Islam's military force. For players of the Infinity War game, you'll definitely want to subscribe when I talk about the future unreleased armies for Haq Islam. To give you a very broad overview, Haq Islam is not just a country with an army. It represents a path to fulfillment for those who follow it. It is a new vision for Islam, born on Earth and recognized on Borak. The religious aspect sheds confining dogma in favor of a philosophy based around the search for knowledge. It is a dualistic tradition that endorses the pursuit of artistic, philosophical, and scientific knowledge on a personal and communal level. Haq Islam is the empowerment of the individual so that humanity can achieve greatness. It is also more than an ideology. It is a nation-state that controls one planet and innumerable trading posts. It is the people that make up the nation, their hopes, their dreams, and their ambitions. The flow of goods and ideas is embedded in the DNA of every Haq Islamite. A monopoly on the silk trade and an entire network of caravanserai spread throughout the human sphere ensure that their mercantile might cannot be challenged anytime soon. And if any power were to dare try, the Sword of Allah would teach them the error of their ways. Our story begins in the Middle East. But east of where? Well, east of Europe, of course. The term is a bit Eurocentric, but there is no consensus for our placement. The Arab world, MENA region, Western Asia, none of them quite work, so our story might be better described as starting in the Muslim world. Islam is a monotheistic religion based around the Quran and Muhammad. Muslims are people who adhere to Islam. The religion itself dates back to the 7th century, and followers of Islam can be found in every corner of the globe. The actual story of Islam is rich and deeply intertwined with the history of the Arab world. And I'm going to stop myself right there, because if I don't, I'm going to be going all day. But I've got great news. Deck over at Corner Case has you covered. Hey, thanks for including me on this. I tried really hard. I pulled local infinity player and cultural consultant and tabletop RPG writer Bashir to talk about Haq Islam. Uh, click on the link and we can talk about representation of Middle Eastern people, of Islamic people, in fiction. The year is 20XX, the middle of the 21st century. Earth's climate continues to collapse. The transition from fossil fuels is badly mismanaged. The North American economy crumbles. Cities are swallowed by encroaching deserts. The economic and social structures of many Arabian cities suffer similar fate to their American counterparts, built on exports that the world didn't want or couldn't afford. A post-oil world becomes a world of conflict between sects, prophets, and extremists. The Islamic world was having an identity crisis, but in this fractious landscape, there was room for change and growth. Many teachings that had been long suppressed by reactionary clergy came to light. Sufism and populist religious teachers supplemented and in some cases even supplanted state clergy. The foremost Islamic thinker of the era was Farhad Kharivar. He was a writer, philosopher, businessman, and most of all, a teacher. He did not cut an imposing figure, but he was gifted with the power of rhetoric and an indescribable charisma. Harivar was extremely good at making his message accessible, simple, and appealing. He argued that the Quran was a text that summoned the faithful to a search for knowledge, but that the message for enlightenment had been crippled under ignorance and fanaticism based in the traditions of Hadith, Sunnah, Ijma, and false Imams. Harivar's best friend and closest adherent was Hamid al-Dan al-Hamdani. Like Harivar, al-Hamdani was devoted to a new, more humanist vision of Islam. Unlike Khadivar, Al-Hamdani was a ruthless billionaire who knew how to use mass media. He controlled news, movies, and the internet, eventually gaining control over most of the communication and media companies in the Islamic world. Khadivar stressed that it was the message, not the messenger, that was of consequence. But Al-Hamdani ensured that Khadivar's message could be heard in every minute of every day in every corner of the world. Amidst the 21st century turmoil, Kharivar made a plea that felt tangible. The search for knowledge meant an external one, to better understand God's creation through scientific inquiry. It also meant an internal search, of personal faith and understanding. Kharivar preached that true prosperity would come to those wealthy in spirit. He maintained that spiritual wealth derived from the rational pursuit of knowledge, art, and enrichment. His presentation had a mass appeal. His message and personality made his vision of Islam seem like the default. 
for the Middle East's elite, this was a powerful tool to unshackle themselves from reactionary imams in favor of a new progressive prosperity. The wealthy and the common dedicated considerable resources to the success of Haq Islam, or New Islam, and for years it grew organically. Haq Islamists set up Khanika, which were teaching and public service centers. As the old nation states of the Middle East collapsed, Khanika became more trusted than any mayor or parliamentarian's office. They also set up Bimaristans, free health clinics that further cemented the movement's reputation for generosity. Khanika were centers of politics and learning, and for many, they represented a stateless nation, a united community that lacked only a land to call their own. Conservatives feared them and targeted them. One group, the Exalted, were led by Imam Khalaf ibn Ahmad, and were responsible for a years-long campaign of violence against Haq Islam in general and Farhad Qadivar in specific. This culminated in the assassination of Qadivar at the age of 42. However, Haq Islam lived on. Their leadership was wealthy, their values enshrined during the many years of Khadivar's sermons and immortalized in his two texts, the springtime of intellect and the quietness of the soul. Khadivar's followers signed the Concords of Tobruk, which laid out the goals and formed a sort of proto-constitution. And in the shadows, Abdul Ahmed Rashad swore that what happened to Khadivar would never happen again. It became clear that the movement couldn't continue to exist as a nation without a homeland. They needed to find a place of their own. After all, Pan Oceani had done so, they'd found planets, so it couldn't be that difficult. Rather than investing in probes and wormhole exploration, Haq Islam attempted astronomy's greatest long shot. Neo-Sufi astronomers visited the Dome of the Rock, where, according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad ascended to heaven. They proposed following, literally, in his footsteps. They recreated the position of the stars and Jerusalem on the night of his ascension, and determined the exact sector of space that was directly over the mosque. With America in collapse, ex-NASA staff and equipment could also be hired on the cheap. This was critical, because this project wasn't entirely based on faith. By narrowing their search to a relatively small grid, the research program could go deep instead of wide. After a series of failed attempts, the project, to the surprise of billions, located a stable wormhole on the other side of the solar system and within the detection cone of their instruments. The Nyla probe was launched, and on the far side of the system, was a terrestrial, habitable world. The success of the project was miraculous. Many were convinced by the mixture of faith and grit that had been required to find such an opportunity. A new capital was declared. O12 recognized Haq Islam as an independent nation based off of the new planet. The billionaires who had funded Haq Islam's growth now funded Haq Islam's pilgrimage to the planet on the far side of the wormhole. Over the course of decades, Major transit routes bloomed across the solar system in order to facilitate the construction of facilities and infrastructure required for such an exodus. When the Great Borak pilgrimage came to an end, those routes remained and the tycoons who controlled them repurposed them for the flourishing, lucrative business of establishing and supplying all the colonies of the burgeoning human sphere. They became the foundation of the great merchant guilds, which now form one of the three key pillars of the Haq Islamite economy. The second of these is biomedical research, which was something that Haq Islamites had already proven themselves masters of back on Earth. This came in the form of numerous Bimaristans constructed across Borak. Bimaristans were now free clinics combined with research hospitals, which covered the healthcare needs of settlers while also exploring new medical protocols and making new pharmacological patents. The most famous and notable discovery, by far, was silk. During the initial terraforming of Borak, the region of Gabkar was mostly excluded. Its forbidding mountains are wild and unchanged. On the sheer cliffs surrounding Kivakala, one can find a strange plant known as Nasiat. This plant is frequently infested with an unusual sap parasite. When this parasite hatches, the plant itself experiences a unique and fundamental chemical change, and in this small window, it can be harvested. This strange reaction simply cannot be reproduced elsewhere because the sap parasite cycle is compromised. This chemical change was a curiosity at first before being adapted into a biomedical delivery agent for gene therapy. Twelve years later, Silk 2.3 revolutionized health sciences once again. This is Silk. It operates on chemical principles derived from new theories of physics resulting from the TCM technological revolution. Silk is inherently inert, although it weaves its way through a host's body like silk through a tapestry. It creates a non-disruptive network which can interact with targets as small as individual cells. This development allowed for unprecedented precision in gene delivery and activation. 
it created an entire industry of gene modding, with the first developments being anti-aging and carcinophagic therapies. With the 2.3 updates, the imagination was your only limit. Fat flushing, 24-hour face morphs, programmable immune responses, stem cell reversion, supercharged soldiers with bone lacing and spare organs. The leaders of Hak Islam were quick to realize that this was one of the most powerful inventions of the century. Rather than simply allowing silk to be sold on the open market, Hak Islam created the Silk Route. Carefully regulated trade companies would transport silk directly to individual buyers, guarded by the nation's small but growing navy. This navy was just a ragtag assortment of ships at first, unable to do more than defend critical targets. This led to the creation of Corsairs and their letters of mark, legalized pirates that would attack small-time foes and defend the silk route. Every batch of silk would have its own unique catalyzing agent, thwarting efforts to reverse engineer it. Despite the best efforts of Pan-Oceanian and Yujingyu scientists, reproducing an Asiat reaction is proven unfeasible. Purchasing from Hak Islam is the best policy. And although the patent rights on silk have long since expired, the cult of secrecy continues. Silk is now a political weapon. It is Hak Islam's ultimate bargaining chip. With great power came great corruption. Power will always exist. The real question is who wields it. The silk consortiums grew as the three main merchant guilds of Hak Islam, with the other two being the aforementioned Master Gardeners and Biohealth Corp. But the silk lords that control those consortia are without a doubt the most powerful and the most corrupt, as well as the most policed. After all, they do control immortality itself. Silk is an essential ingredient in countless biohealth products, most especially Losts and Resurrection. This wealth from silk led to massive growth. Across the human sphere, space stations known as Caravanserai blossomed like flowers. Every Caravanserai was a free port, a version of the Kanika, a neutral outpost where anyone could do business. They were located around the platforms of Villa Boosters, and along the circular routes, or in orbit, and basically anywhere where there was money to be made. They became the premier stations for space-based trade across the stars. For a small fee, any vessel could register to fly the flag of Hak Islam. It wasn't just trade, though. The Biohealth Corps gained an unshakable reputation as first-rate doctors. Master gardeners were in great demand on newly settled worlds like Concilium Prima. The population across the human sphere skyrocketed thanks to artificial organic wombs developed by the Natalia Corporation, bringing the population of Borak to 1.5 billion people. In 14 NC, during the Phantom Conflict, Aleph fought a cold war with the Nomad Nation. Using proxies in Pan-Oceania and Yujing, Aleph worked to starve the Nomads into submission. Hak Islam's sympathies lay with the Nomads, whose rise they had helped to facilitate. Unable to openly dispatch military aid, Admiral Turgut Zaybek rounded up a fleet of Corsair ships and flew them to Tunguska, wherein they pledged to become mercenaries for the duration of the conflict. The real test of Hak Islam's military instability was in the year 30 NC. Haji Mudassar attempted a series of deep-reaching financial reforms. Infuriated, the Silk Lords used their vast resources to hire mercenaries. They launched a sphere-wide revolt, focused primarily on Borak and the Caravanserai. Standing fast against the plutocrats were the Sekban, a simple volunteer defense unit named after the Ottoman musketeer garrisons. The fighting was chaotic. Bashi Bazooks massacred hundreds of civilians on the Al-Umara station. Hikmet Bey, one of the Silk Lords, founded Kaplan Tactical Services to defend his vast empire, equipping them with the advanced Blitzen disposable EM launcher. This was a war of wealth. Who could pay more and who could outfox the other? The Silk Lords brought massive numbers of weapons to the fight. Farabex, that being Czech for Sparrow, were purchased in bulk from Zeva CZ. Huge numbers of Bashi Bazooks were contracted. Corsairs were deployed on both sides, supporting the central government and the Silk Lords. A given Corsair captain might be loyal to one lord, then switch sides based on who offered more lucrative targets. Some Corsairs were press ganged into the growing Kapu Kalki, while others disappeared into neutral ports or emigrated to avoid the chaos. For example, Humayad Bey, owner of the Corsair ship Teleki? Telike? Te ah, oh, shit. Teleki? Yeah, I don't know. The, it, the Danger. The ship was called the Danger, sided with the dissident Silk Lords and operated out of the Rila Caravanserai, a hollowed out Trojan in Jupiter's orbit. Conversely, Captain Katar Natalagawa became a double agent, loyal to the Hajib. They would accept contracts to target government ships, only to leak those details to loyalist naval assets. 
After several years of fighting, the central government prevailed. Captain Natalagawa was given the Teleke as a prize, renaming it to the Haji's Revenge. Numerous reforms were made that improved the central government's ability to regulate trade, but at the cost of more internal privileges for the Silk Lords. The Azrael unit was formed as a heavy assault squad to obliterate those who would interfere with trade in the future. Kaplan Tactical Services was spun off from corporate security to its own independent mercenary group, instantly gaining numerous buyers for their high-quality contracts and excellent soldiers. Tarek Mansuri, a decorated veteran of the wars, applied to the Runihura Super Soldier Program. Katranata Lagawa was quietly assassinated by forces unknown two years after the peace deal. That was a generation ago. Hak Islam Civil War is an entry in a book for most and a memory for the rest. But the role of silk production and the greed it creates remains paramount. The corrupting influence of the Silk Lords is felt most powerfully in the regional governments of Gabkar and Funduk. The former is home to silk production, the latter is the site of the space elevator that connects silk trade up to the human sphere. As a result of the revolts, the regional governments and the Silk Lords are codependent, each with concessions that limit and expand their power. Each works hard to control the other. This push and pull reached new heights since Karim Bey became Sultan of Funduk and Lord of the Gate. Publicly, at least, he's made it his mission to break the power of the Silk Consortium. Whether his motives are pure, or is just trying to replace Silk Lords who oppose him with those who are more amenable, remains to be seen. Either way, it has made him many enemies. Karim Bey never sleeps in the same place two nights in a row, and is constantly surrounded by elite bodyguards, especially Odalisks. The relationship between Hak Islam's wealthy elites and its central government remains one of the main concerns for the nation of Hak Islam. The nation of Hak Islam itself is a parliamentary democracy that represents several semi-autonomous regions on Borak. The most important are the al Madinat Caliphate, the Funduk Sultanate, the Iran Jat al Ahmad Shahi, and the Gabkar Khanate, though there are numerous smaller regions as well, such as the Bahiti Hoya, Baniya, and the Partalia. At the top of the government is the Hajib, the president. They are elected by a nationwide popular vote. The most recent Hajib is Aisha bint Osman. She is notable for being the first president not born on Borak, having instead been born and raised on Zvalarima during the Silk Revolts. Aisha became involved in politics when she studied philosophy at the Sidig El Tahir Academy. Osman has won re-election more than once. She has a reputation for preferring military advisors over business leaders and sees the military as a tool to be used. Aisha is no autocrat, but she values security. Many among the caravanserai and silk trade see her as bad for business. Below the Hajib are the Majlis, the parliament of Hak Islam. The lower Majlis is separated into four smaller parliaments, one for each of the regional governments. The upper house is the Majlis al Borak, with its members divided evenly between national ethnic groups and also chosen by national popular elections. Passing national law, therefore, requires agreement between the Majlis al Borak and at least two of the lower regional Majlis. Below this are the Diwans large bureaucracies that run the day-to-day -day operations of the government. They have overlapping purpose, but are deliberately firewalled to keep power divided. There are a dozen major diwans, including the Diwan al-Jun, the Diwan al-Mazilim, the Diwan al-Hajim, the Diwan al-Rasail, the Diwan al-Nawal, the Diwan al-Paradiso, and there are also numerous temporary diwans, often formed by decree or law for short-term purposes. All of these have their primary office on Nawal Island, at the core of Nawal is the bureaucratic heart of Borak, the city of Khadija. The presidential palace is at the center of Khadija, surrounded by the Diwans. Past that is the Majlis district, with four quarters of this wide ring representing the character of the four main regions of Borak, and also functioning as the four national Majlis. Crossing them all is the Grand Promenade, a wide road that extends from the ring around the Majlis and out through the city itself. It is a parade route, a ceremonial space, and is reinforced so heavily that even the mighty Magariba Guard can traverse it. As a sign of respect, every local festival and public holiday from across Borak is celebrated in Khadija. As a result, there are an exceptionally large number of free days and celebrations in the city. The central government recently placed a limit on the holidays enjoyed across the regions in order to maintain a realistic working year in the capital. Hak Islam is more than just a nation state and a people. It is also a religion and a way of life. Together, the planet has been slowly transformed, as have the people. The pillar of their modern culture is now a descendant rather than a direct child of Islam. The five pillars of Islam are faith in God, prayer, charity, fasting, and pilgrimage. Hak Islam is similar, 
but it is a teeming garden of ideas and practices, rooted in Islam and watered by change. The core principles of Hak Islam are the search for knowledge, Salik, Elias Sabr, and Zakat. The most important belief is the search for knowledge. Farhad Khadivar held that reason was the greatest attribute of the human being and believed that mankind's foremost obligation in life was therefore pursuit of artistic, philosophical, and scientific knowledge. It was through this pursuit that one could come to know the face of God and unlock the gates of paradise. The Quran says sight cannot perceive him, yet he perceives all that is seen. The comprehension of him is subtle, yet he comprehends all. We cannot gaze directly upon our Lord's face. We must instead seek him as he seeks us by gazing with subtlety upon all facets of the world. The springtime of intellect. Kadivar outlined two pathways by which the search for knowledge could be carried out. First, understanding the cosmos through scientific inquiry of the outer world, and second, by pursuing paradise through speculative internal reasoning. The first approach is to understand the world by comprehending it. One can comprehend God's creation by rationally assembling knowledge of physics and math and biology to get a complete picture of creation. The second approach is to apprehend it, to intuitively grasp meaning and goals, to vibe with it. It is knowing the meaning of a thing without really knowing the dictionary definition. It is a poetical description of art, or feeling that sees more than what is literally observed. Yes, Gundams and anime may just sell toys, that's the real answer, but also it's sometimes about how important communication is, and sometimes it's also about Street Fighter. Our world is cloaked in a magnetic field. Within that field, we perceive the Arctic and the Antarctic as being separate and opposed. But in truth, there is only one field. It is unified, and the entire world rests within it. So too does the entirety of our soul rest within the single, unbroken continuum of truth. The quietness of the soul. There are two primary implementations of the search for knowledge. They are not official organizations, they are not political parties, and even the most extreme supporters of one acknowledge the validity and use of the other. Hak Islam is a dualistic tradition, forming two halves of an individual's life. Hak Mutazilite traditions are based around academic sciences, technology, hard sciences, mathematics, engineering. The most prominent members are Hakim, a word which means both doctor and philosopher. Hakim are scientists and medical doctors and industrial engineers. Meanwhile, the neo-Sufis of Haq Tasawwuf prioritize the grasping of the ungraspable. The most prominent Tasawwuf are known as Mawla, and they are community leaders and patrons and guides. Mawla are the historians, artists, psychologists, and cultural figures of the world. Tasawwuf gather at Zawiyas, centers of literature and meditation and the Quranic study, though Haq Islamites attend both Zawiyas and academic institutions equally. The Tasawwuf have a leadership known as the Council of Wali, a secretive and insightful group, rarely seen by the public. Only their spokesman is seen in public. There are rumors that the Council of Wali has in fact used experimental silk technologies to form a joint consciousness, though their circumspect nature prevents further investigation. The other traits within Haq Islam are Salik, originally a term for Sufi travelers and pilgrims, Salik soon became an identity for all those who joined the Borak pilgrimage and a byword for bold adventure. Salik means sharing and reflecting on one's adventures and experiences, individually via meditation or, more particularly, with trusted friends. Salik is key to daily life, and sharing your personal opinions and experiences is very common. Ikhya means environmental stewardship and conservation. It means bringing the land to life. It's common sense for most, but there was a time when people on Earth were pretty destructive with their environment. It has practical as well as philosophical implications. If a merchant fails to maintain or grow sales, a trade diwan might give the space away to somebody else. Putting things to proper use, not wasting. Sabr, or endurance, or persistence, is less defined, and it means more to individual people. Essentially, it means, you know, grit. A believer might go without food or water during daylight hours to fast. They might isolate themselves quantronically for a few minutes a day. They might refrain from intoxicants or stimulants for a long time. The idea is that you are trying to avoid waste. How you define that is entirely up to you. But it is a frequent point of interfaith dialogue. 
Zakat is a yearly charitable tithe, equivalent to 5% of your wealth, possessions, and income. You only have to pay the Zakat if you make more than the minimum wage, which is essentially equivalent to the Demigrant. These funds are distributed to the infirm, elderly, refugees, orphans, or as part of the main Demigrant program. Hak Islam is a very tolerant society, welcoming visitors and immigrants of all ethnicities and creeds. It is particularly open to fellow people of the book, Christians, Jews, and Muslims of other sects. There are many close-knit minority religious communities in the various cities of Borak. Perhaps the most famous is the bustling Jewish quarter in Dar al Funduk, the largest such community on the planet. In short, religion is a fundamental part of life on Borak. Many traditional practices are prominent, such as the wudu, the ritual washing, or the salah, the five daily prayers. However, most of these elements are relaxed or reinterpreted through a new calendar lens. Tom logs remind you of Salah, but this is just a reminder to contemplate, reflect, and introspect on yourself. You don't need to face Mecca right now, you're probably busy. But like, how you doing? You doing okay? You talked to your parents lately? What's getting in the way of you being happy? There is a great emphasis on communal activities. Weddings, public debates, watching Maya, all these things encourage active participation in a community and people. In short, religion is vital, but an emphasis on observances has been replaced with an emphasis on thoughts and deeds, on personal growth and self-examination. The original meeting places of the Hak Islam movement were called Khanika. They remain prominent communal spaces where ideas are encouraged to have a free voice. They can be parks, meeting halls, mosques, or more specialized spaces. They are the scaffolding that build society. On Earth, they were free clinics, and on Borak, they are research hospitals, the most prominent of which are in al Madinat. Universities are the most famous Khanika, places where the twin traditions of the academies and Zawiyas come together. But the most common Khanika are the Karavansarai. These are free ports located across space at key junctions on interstellar trade routes. They are neutral outposts where anyone can do business, welcoming ideas and money from all sources. At the center of each Karavansarai is the Winter Hall, a place to buy and sell and rest and resupply in as much luxury as possible. These caravanserai are usually located along circular routes or near the platforms of Villa Boosters. They are owned and managed by Hakislamite companies with some small support from the central Borak government. All of them have an appointed Trade Diwan, who represents the nation-state and can perform limited diplomatic functions. Trade Diwans also make sure that caravanserai are profitable. They'll allow any ship to register out of Hakislamite space, so every station ends up being a home port to hundreds of small trade companies, corsairs, smugglers, and ships from all nations. Caravanserai are usually orbital stations, generally made from asteroids. Nomad crews are hired to hollow out chunks of rock and fill them with habitation modules while the object is moved towards a Lagrange point. Nomad engineers apply radiation shielding, then cover caravanserai in a thick layer of ice as an inexpensive solution to protect from meteors and debris. Long antennae and docking modules poke from the ice to guide ships closer. Hak Islam has a first-rate military in practice, even if it's got a disjointed one on paper. See, there are independent regional armies that compete with each other politically. They over-specialize and they are deeply factional. But uh, this is only sometimes true. Hak Islam High Command knows how to use these disparate troops as a coordinated strike force. It does not matter that the training regimes and standards are wildly different. Commanders can leverage these troop types together, softening the enemy with Qum bikers, hammering them with Al Fasid, and flanking them with mercenaries. The only combat force directly controlled by the national government, that is, high command, is the national army known as the Sword of Allah. This is, in terms of raw personnel, the largest standing force in the human sphere. That's because of the Ghulam. There are lots of these guys, loads of them. They're light troops with decent equipment and consistent training. They are the core of the Antikytherum doctrine. The Ghulam is a gear train, synchronizing the actions of specialists in regional armies. The Ghulam is the hammer, forcing enemy forces into firefights with elite specialists that function as the anvil. Ghulam are better trained than many of their counterparts in Pan-Oceania, Yujing, or even the Nomads, in the sense that they are a true standing military. Ghulam are an all-volunteer force and they spend more time training than other line troops. This helps them to make up for their inferior technology. Though they lack in the most advanced firepower, they do possess the Askari Sayad, an extremely popular service rifle. The standard version of the Sayad also possesses an integrated flechette shotgun for breaching or boarding action. In short, Ghulam possess iron discipline for line infantry, and whenever the Sword of Allah goes on maneuvers, Ghulam are always accompanied by other special troops 
like Hassassins or the Rama Task Force or the Gabkar Khanate's troops. Also under the sword of Allah, is the Hakislamite Armada. This is the national navy, although its activities are highly compartmentalized. The Armada is no slouch, but its main jobs are home defense and transport. It has been used for combat missions, of course, including the conflicts around Paradiso, Human Edge, and Concilium. Because the Armada is limited by resources, infrastructure, and budgets, the navy lacks the mid-sized warships of its rivals. However, it has far fewer borders to defend, and its doctrine makes the Armada a potent combat force, if not a potent invasion force. Most of the Navy are auxiliary craft that focus on speed and precision, and their missions are espionage, insertion, and pursuit. Gunships arrive on the scene, hit first, and hit fast. The Kerkenes, or Kestrel gunships, are atmosphere-capable vessels designed for suborbital fire support. They are fragile, but they are capable of extremely high performance. The learning curve is steep, though, considering that multi-role nature. Most of the time, naval support comes in the form of Corsairs who pilot a bewildering diversity of spacecraft. The Alphad, or Cheetah, is a defining example of the Hakislamite Armada's doctrine. It has the Niran Makluba, or inverted fire system, which can cloak the ship by running dark and disappearing off of radars. The Makluba Shroud also powers the ship's primary weaponry, an advanced particle acceleration device. Discharges have to be carefully managed lest it cook the crew alive with excessive heat. The Cheetah frigate, therefore, is speedy, lethal, and unfair, both to crew or to fight against. The most feared common ship of the Armada is the Al Hakika. In Sufism, Hakika is what is real, genuine, authentic, what is true in and of itself by dint of cosmic status. If you don't understand, you don't have to. The truth of the ship is nobody in the human sphere is safe from the Armada. The Al Hakika class destroyer is a massive warship that's as fast as a blockade runner. It hits and runs with incredible maneuverability thanks to the help of nomad astroneers. It is an assassin's blade that eliminates single targets alongside Corsairs and couple Kalki ships that screen and cause chaos. Though not the most feared, the most prestigious ship of all is the Safiya Sultana. Its namesake presided over the so-called Sultanate of Women, an era where the wives and mothers of Ottoman sultans were the true power behind the throne. The Safiya Sultana is the last of her line, and there will be no more. Naval theory no longer prioritizes the colossal stellar behemoths of old. But while other ships blossom and grow, the Sultana remains the true gray eminence of the fleet. She is slow, unwieldy, and expensive, but she's also a command station, a carrier, an orbital bombardier, and a missile dome all at once. Her glory days were decades ago, during the neo-colonial wars, but that hasn't stopped her. She remains by Borak's side, where she guards the throne with maternal attention. The Armada is solid, reliable, and kind of a boring service compared to the exciting Kapul Kalki. The QK is the regional army of the Funduk Sultanate, and it is exceedingly corrupt. They serve the vital role of safeguarding Hakislam's international trade and the Silk Route. Their flexibility means that they have strong relationships with mercenaries, and they are a distinctly hybrid force. Under-resourced, understaffed, and suffering from myriad internal issues, not to mention recent defeats, the QK has to be resourceful when defending Hakislam's interests. Those relationships are with groups from across the sphere. Kaplan Tactical Service, Nomad Mercenary Groups, even the Druze Society. The Kapu Kalki's job is protection of trade throughout the human sphere, and also of powerful individuals wherever they travel. That, combined with that aforementioned corruption in their bureaucracy, means that actually coordinating these efforts is its own art form. That's why the Balasahir Naval Academy exists. Named after the city of Balasahir in Turkey, this academy trains, among others, the Hafsa unit. Named for guardian angels in Islamic mythology who protect a believer from the influence of the devil, the Hafsas take personal responsibility for the lives of their soldiers. They are known for their leadership, their tactical flexibility, and their willingness to lead by example. They are so valuable that Kapul Kalki issues Hafsas with special holoprojector concealment technology to preserve them on the battlefield. Any Kapul Kalki soldier calmly issuing orders could be a Hafsa in disguise. And then, there are the Assassins. There are many rumors, but they are a publicly known organization. They are Etvak, and they predate the settlement of Borak. Etvak is an acronym for... Shit. 
Etelat va amniat e keshvar, a Farsi phrase meaning circle of intelligence and security. The Hassassins already considered themselves the intelligence organization for Hakizlam. After the government was established on Borak, it became officially listed as an agency under the Diwan al Jundut as Etvak. This is the public face, though, a mysterious society that operates as the National Military Intelligence Group. It is a cover for the Hassassin Barum which is supposedly a top-secret organization that controls the Special Ops Division of the National Military. But everyone knows that Etvok's boring exterior masks that spicy spec ops. What not everyone knows is that the Barum is another layer of secrecy. The true Hassassin Order operates out of top-secret bases in the Alamut deserts of the Iran Jat al anat Shanate. This, the core of the sect, is not truly under the Hajib's control. The Hassassins are a law unto themselves. Hak Islamite leaders are reluctant to admit this in public. The Hajib takes the blame when it has to, and denies when it can. Sometimes the actions of that innermost society are popular. Often they inspire revulsion, but it's better to keep Hassassins within the household, even if they act up, than to disown them or admit that they do whatever they please. The society's leader is the mysterious Old Man of the Mountain. There are some who say that the old man is, in fact, still Abdulhamad Rashad himself, the founder of the Assassin Order. There are others that say the old man is an artificial intelligence. The old man uses a neutral voice. Nobody knows their face, their gender. Whatever the truth, they determine what is a threat to the ongoing search for knowledge. These threats are not just to Haq Islam, but to humanity's development in general. Those that perform unethical experiments are targeted for elimination, as are ultra-conservatives that stand in the way of progress. Once these targets are marked, death inevitably follows. There's so much more to say about Haq Islam, Borak, its regional armies, its regional governments, its philosophy, but those will all have to wait. I'm sure you're all eager to hear more about the Hassassins, for example. This is the end of the video. Uh, those videos, I promised, they're coming. And if you want them, you'll have to subscribe. And if you want to help me incentivize, you want me to make more, go to my Patreon. Uh, take a look. Till the next time, happy eating. Bye-bye.